preaching. Brother Lou is coming in from Ohio to do the meeting. Uh, this uh, Saturday, if anyone's interested, we'll do like we do every year. We go out in the morning with invitations into the neighborhood to invite people to come to the revival. It's a revival to try and get souls saved primarily. And then secondarily, you know, fellowship of saints and, and that type of thing. So if anybody's interested, uh, Saturday morning at uh, 930 at uh, Pete's uh, Church at 350 Austin Street, we'll gather together. We have a little prayer. He usually provides a little a quick breakfast, and then we hit the streets. And then usually when we get back, he uh, cooks hot dogs or something. And so anyone's interested, this week is the week. All right, are we all set here? And uh, we're continuing our studies in the book of Jeremiah, a long a book, a great a book. And uh, we're coming to chapter 30 tonight. And what's going to happen is the Lord is going to give a new a section of the book, a 10-chapter section to Jeremiah, beginning in chapter 30 and running through chapter uh, 39. And in this uh, portion, what God is going to show the prophet is a number of uh, near-term prophecies that will happen very soon in uh, the life of Jeremiah and the nation, and the far-term prophecies that will extend all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in the near term, what he's uh, showing them is that uh, Judah's king, the one sitting on the throne now, will be taken captive to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, and that the city of Jerusalem will fall. Now, we're, we're living in the times of Jeremiah. And in the very near term, the United States will fall. There's no question about it. And um, and so, you know, we're, we're telling people these things. It happens this decade. And I know people get angry about it. But uh, we tell them because um, when it does happen, what they'll say is, why didn't you tell us? Well, we, we have told you. We're telling you this is the decade when World War III will begin. It will be a world war, including on the soil right here. No insulation. It's over in Europe and Asia. It'll be right here and in Europe and in Asia and in South America. I was watching my wife. We were out this morning. I said, look at all the cars driving around, enjoying their Sunday. They better enjoy because the world wars are coming real soon and they won't be enjoying anymore. Yes, and, and the near-term prophecy is real. And the difference with us is the near-term also encompasses the far-term because it is the second coming of the Lord. And as he shows Jeremiah back in 600 BC, the near-term prophecy is you're going to be taken to Babylon and your capital will fall in the far-term but at the second coming, the 12 tribes of Israel will go through a time described right here in the 30th chapter in verse 7. Alas, that day is great, uh, that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. And the 12 tribes will go through the time of Jacob's trouble, which, we, which Jesus called the tribulation. In the Olivet Discourse, he spoke of the tribulation of those days in Matthew 24, 29. And uh, so as we're going through these 10 chapters, we're going to learn a lot of things about future prophecy, but not only future prophecy, about present realities. And one of the realities that we're going to learn is there is a difference. There is a great difference between when God chastises and God punishes. Uh, God takes the unbelieving and the fearful, the fearful and the unbelieving, Revelation, and punishes them, and the result is destruction, damnation, and perdition. But for his children, the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, those of us, uh, we go through uh, times of chastisement, but it doesn't end in destruction and damnation. The end result is restoration and renewal. As he will say in the 11th uh, verse of this chapter, 
Um, although I make a, okay, I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I've scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure. And the chastisement is for correction and restoration and renewal. And so this 30th chapter, which opens this new 10 chapter portion of Jeremiah, is going to have both prophecies and promises alternating throughout the entire chapter. Uh, the promise in, uh, of the return to the land in verses 1 through 3, and then the prophecy of the time of Jacob's trouble, verses 4 through 9, and then the promise that Jacob will finally be at rest, verses 10 through 15, and then the prophecy that all the enemies of Israel, who are the enemies of God, will be destroyed, verses 16 and 17, and then the promise that although Jerusalem is going to fall in the near term, Jerusalem will be rebuilt forever in the verses 18 through 24. So it's a good chapter. Uh, there's a lot in here. Uh, let's read and see what the Lord has for us. Uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter uh, 30, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet. He's not a New Testament prophet. So what we are going to read in this chapter historically and doctrinally applies to Jeremiah and Jeremiah's people, not to the church. The church is New Testament. So we're learning how to rightly divide the word of truth. I, 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 there was a question yesterday on Ask of the Pastor, and they asked the question out of Jeremiah. And they, tr and then they said, well, is he talking about Christmas trees in the fourth chapter? And they had no idea. Uh, we don't know. We, we don't know. We don't know. Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet. They're talking about making idols in the Old Testament. And there's such confusion today. Modern pastors have no idea how to rightly divide the word of truth. The word that came to Jeremiah, verse 1, the Old Testament prophet from the Lord, saying, verse 2, thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, not of the church, but of Israel. God had much to say about Israel. He still has much in his heart about Israel. He's going to renew, restore, rebuild, and set Israel again at the head of nations in the millennial kingdom. This is just so we, we understand. He's not speaking to the church. Now, there are spiritual truths. We'll get out of it, some practical things. But doctrinally, historically, this is Israel. So when we read about Jacob's trouble, it's Jacob's trouble. Jacob is the one that was had his name changed to Israel. Talking about Israel. Um, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I've spoken unto thee in a book. What would the name of that book be? That would be the Holy Bible. Whose idea was it to write the Holy Bible? It was Jeremiah's. No, it was God's. God directed him to write the book. This is God's book. The Bible was written by God. He used men, has pens in his hand, but they wrote the words that he told them to write. Jeremiah didn't add words, and Jeremiah didn't subtract words. He just faithfully recorded the words. Uh, write thee all the words that I've spoken unto thee in a book. Don't add, don't subtract, write what I said. God communicates in words. A Bible is a book full of words. Not thoughts, not messages, not uh, concepts whereby I can look in a lexicon and say, you know, another word for this is no. God says, I wrote the words that I wanted written down. You'd think I'm not capable of doing that? 
Uh, the English language, according to the modern Webster's Dictionary, has over 650,000 words in it. God chose 6,000 words to put in his Bible. And he said, I can say everything I need to say to you with 6,000 simple, plain words that you can understand. I speak to you in a manner like um, of simplicity. It's called the simplicity of Christ. Like, like when we were kids and, and we would hear uh, three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run. That, that's simple. Now, you take God said, I'm going to choose from the 6,000. These are going to be the words I'm going to use, and you'll be able to understand them. I was talking to Chris Krasnowski, who's been uh, reading to his uh, little boy, I don't know if he's seven years old, and teaching him to read out of the King James Bible. And he said, we have no problem. Every so often, yes, we'll use a dictionary, but you'll use a dictionary with any book every so often. But, but he has no problem reading and understanding the words. They're simple. Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run. Yeah, that, that's how God wants to communicate. Now you get scholars, and they got to put big, great, swelling words. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, a triumvirate of uh, three rodents, three uh, retinally detached rodents. A triumvirate of three retinally detached rodents. A triumvirate of three retinally detached rodents. Observe carefully how they ambulate with rapidity. Now, I mean, how God chose the words that he wants, all the words that he wants to make it easy for us. We don't need idiot scholars changing God's words. And you're wise to believe what God has written and to read his words. Um, anyways, getting back to where we are uh, historically, this is the God of Israel. Jeremiah, I want you to write in a book, and I want you to tell your people, verse 3, Lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Why is he telling him this? He's encouraging Jeremiah because he's told him a few chapters earlier, the king of Babylon's going to come. He's going to lay siege to the land. He's finally going to come into the walls of the holy city, carry off the king captive and a whole bunch of people. And you're going to live under his rulership for, like he said, uh, 70 years in the last chapter, 70 years of captivity. And the thought would be, well, you know, after a city's been destroyed for 70 years and taken over by a foreign leader it's not likely to be rebuilt and if it's rebuilt it'll be rebuilt with a different name no i'm promising you jerusalem will be rebuilt i'm going to bring you back to the land you are going to return to the land guaranteed god says write it in a book now, the prophecies that i give regarding the coming of my son, both the first and the second coming, and his work are guaranteed, and, and you'll return to the land in the near time. And then we're going to see in the far, far time, they're going to return and possess it forever and ever. Uh, verse uh, 4, he has to go with a prophecy now, in addition to the promise of the return. The prophecy is, these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Now, he keeps saying this over and over because the sad thing is it's been about 280 years since the civil war that divided the land. And the land was divided. And it was not just divided geographically, it was divided ideologically and religiously. And it would be like uh, back living in the 1800s, you were either a Yankee or you were a Southerner, and, and that's what it was, and, and they had no uh, affection one toward another. They viewed each other in a negative light, and a lot of that even carries over to this day. When we were in Kentucky, they looked at us as Yankees, and this was 1980-something, and it still carries over. Well, they were divided, and God wants them to know that he's going to bring back the captivity of his people and bring them together. 
He's going to reunite them under the true God and under true religion and under one Messiah. They won't be divided anymore like they've been for a long time. And so the words that the Lord is speaking here is concerning Israel, verse 4, and concerning Judah. I'm interested in both of them. Uh, spiritually, the Lord, we'll look historically, spiritually the Lord is interested in both his nation Israel and his bride, the church. And so we understand when we read these things, there are practical spiritual applications to us because the lessons God's teaching his nation, he also wants to teach his bride because we're going to be there when the nation is set up in the millennium as the bride. And so we need to learn a lot of lessons too, which is why we study the scriptures. Anyways, the words that the Lord spake, again, these are the Lord's words. He's, he's letting us know over and over and over. Uh, verse 1, the word. Verse 2, uh, the words. Uh, verse 4, uh, the words. Over and over. God is telling us these are my words. They're carefully chosen. Uh, trust and believe. And obey. And stop listening to anyone that would uh, turn you from my words and the counsel of the Lord which would be most of your modern scholars, whom most are not even saved, but they do speak Hebrew and Greek. But big deal. There's unsaved people that also speak English. You don't want to listen to them either. Um, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, We've heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. And, and this is the word that's been coming down. The terror of the Lord and the terror of the surrounding nations has been upon Israel for quite a while because they got away from God. And when they got away from God, they were under his hand of protection. God wants you to stay close to him and he'll protect you. But he will give you enough rope. If you want to run off on your own, you can. But when you run off on your own, there are wolves out there that will hurt you. There are bears out there that will devour you. There are, there are dreadful beasts out there that will damage you. And they had gotten away from God, and the beasts were about and causing trouble, and they've heard trembling and fear and not peace. Verse 6, Ask ye now, and see, whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Why am I seeing this? Why am I seeing men with no backbone, effeminate men that can't take a stand? This was the problem. What, were they gotten away from the strength of God's word? You're given strength and nutrition and backbone and valor and vigor and virtue from the word of God. And when you get away from it and you turn to idols, that's what you look like. You look like men, like with women, with long ponytails and uh, women in travail, and they're all turned to paleness. They're afraid of everything. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. And they have phobias and fears and anxieties, and that's what was happening in Israel. We see that practically in the church today. Why is that? We've gotten away from the words that the Lord has spoken. We've gotten away from the words that God told his men to write in a book. We've decided to write our own books and put Bible on it. And, and we've got men like this today that can't take a stand. And, and they, they can't take a stand spiritually. They can't take a stand socially. They, they can't, probably can't take a stand physically, although that's the least important of all. But they can't take a stand. Where have the pulpits been for the past 50 years? Where have the pulpits been that have screamed against the outrages of this society killing babies in the womb? Telling little boys that it's okay to think you're a little girl. Uh, allowing, allowing the same sex in a bathroom that has a different name on it. What, what is, where are the men taking a stand? Well, this is controversial, they say. Without controversy, God says, there is no controversy to these things. Godliness is, is manifest in the book. There's no controversy. It's black or white. Why do we have men like this? And because they've turned away from God's words, the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel, concerning Judah, and concerning his church. Now, regarding Israel, the prophecy is this. If you think it's bad now, where do you see it? Verse 7, when the great day comes, alas, 
for that day is great when they really will be like women running around in a tizzy, men who are supposed to be leaders and, and in the front and with the women and children behind. Uh, that day will be great. None is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Thank goodness the sentence is on end, but he shall be saved out of it. And we know who the Savior is. But this is a time of Jacob's trouble. Again, on the board here, we see the Lord called Abraham. The Lord sent the Messiah. They rejected the Messiah, and the Lord built a parentheses age of the church that we're part of. But this gets removed, and the Lord moves right back onto his plan with his people, the Jews. And the next step, since their rejection of the Messiah, is a time of trouble and tribulation to turn their eyes back to the Messiah. And when they do, the Messiah sets up the kingdom. But they must go through this time of trouble. They must uh, reap what they've sown. And this is what they're going to go through. And it's a great day. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. It is Jewish. It's not the church. We won't be here when this goes on. We are the bride. We've been formed from the time of the resurrection and completed at the time of the rapture. And then in a rapturous way, are lifted off the planet across the threshold into the clouds to be with the bridegroom himself. And then we return to Jacob's trouble and the time of Israel. Go to Psalm 137. Today, there's so much confusion that uh, the men of leading the churches don't understand these things because they've abandoned the words of God. Psalm 137. And at this time here, which is going to occur about less than 10 years after Jeremiah has given this promise and this chapter, the Babylonians come in, we'll read about it, I think in chapter 39, and they finally take Zedekiah and they take him all captive. And Psalm 137 is what happens then when they're sitting now by the rivers of Babylon. And we sat down and yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. I mean, look how much we lost and how quickly it, it was gone. Look how fast the towers came down in a day back in 2001. That was just God warning you the 21st century. This is a century things are going to happen and things are going to come down. And, and this is the decade where it's all going to happen. And, uh, and if there are a few that do survive, they're going to be looking back, remembering. Um, the Jews, though, that did escape the captivity of, um, let's say, having their life taken from them, but were finally taken in the shackles off to Babylon to serve there. We, verse 2, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, in the midst of Babylon. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song, kind of in a mocking manner, like if, if America it was taken over by the Chinese or, or the communists, the Reds, or Russia, and, uh, and now they're here, and the troops are in the streets, and our flags have been taken down, and they say, hey, yeah, why don't you sing one of those old, uh, sing the Star Spangled Banner now. Sing America the Beautiful Now. Huh? It's all over, isn't it? And, and uh, they're just mocking, and they're mocking the Jews to sing. They that carried us away captive required of us a song. They that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, go ahead, sing one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I mean, we're captive now. We, we can't do that. The Lord's song is meant to be sung in the Lord's house. It's meant to be sung in the Lord's land. Uh, because that's where the Lord is, and we're in a place where the Lord isn't. Uh, verse 5, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. 
And what God was doing in the time of the captivity was now having taken all of the worldly pleasures away, letting them realize your heart really is married to the Lord and the Lord's land and the Lord's city. And what, the, what God needs to do to chasten his children sometime is to let them get carried away captive where they think back and they go, you know, the only really good times I had was when I was in the Lord's house with the Lord's people praising the Lord. The rest of this stuff is empty and vain. And sometimes we don't realize it until things are taken away. And, and this was done to the Jews back then. Uh, verse 7. And then in the heart they're praying, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. The children of Edom. Edom is another word for, it's almost like Adam. It's, it's like, it means red, and Adam means red, and Adam was taken from the red clay. And it means uh, still in their natural birth, in their first birth, their first blood. And, and the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem said, raise it, raise it to the foundation. We want to destroy God's word, God's city, God's house, God's work. The natural man not only doesn't receive the things of God, it hates the things of God. And, and that's not only your neighbor, practically, that's the natural man left in us. We don't particularly like it either. And God wants to kindle a flame in the new birth so we can burn off the dross of the old birth. But practically, historically, you've got these Jews surrounded by these Edomites, these Babylonians, who are saying, destroy, uh, destroy our nation. And they had won a temporary victory, a short uh, battle that they had won. God's going to win the war. Satan wins some battles, but he'll never win the war. And while they were there, they were praying, verse 7, Remember, O Lord, remember these guys who wanted to destroy your work. And then they said in verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. I mean, you, you trampled on us, but our Messiah is going to come back, and he's going to take pleasure in destroying you because you're against his father you're against his words you're against his work you're against righteousness you're against holiness you're against all that is good i mean you're serving the devil and you're serving evil and you're progressing as progressives putting more sin in society and more sin in children and he's going to be happy to come back and reward you the way you've served us verse 9 Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. He's going to destroy the uh, fathers and the mothers and the children of all those who are against God and his holiness and his words. That puts a lot of responsibility on mothers and fathers to train your children right. Because there's a point where they're going to get trapped in the destruction. And you read in the Old Testament how God told them when he went and you take out the Canaanites and you take out the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Gergeshites and you destroy all of them, man, woman, and child. Why? Because these are families that are against God. And I'm not going to have them in my land, saith the Lord. They can live in their own land, but not in mine. And so you, you run them out or kill them, but you do not allow them in my land. They're not living in heaven now, and God's not going to permit them when he comes back to set up his millennial kingdom. Back to where we are. These are truths, people. You, you better start realigning your mind and your heart with the way God thinks, or he'll do some serious realigning in you. This world is upside down and backwards. Have a nice day. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. There's none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it because happy will the Messiah be when he comes back and saves them out of it. And the prophecy is given there 
uh, and we understand, again, it's uh, Jacob's trouble. This is the beginning of what is known as the seven-year tribulation that is spoken of. Uh, we're doing the studies. I'll take you there real quick. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Knowing some of the great prophecies in the Bible, these are high water prophecy marks. For for an Old Testament Jew, these are passages kind of like your John three sixteen, which you like to know. Okay, they like to know these verses: Daniel nine twenty four through twenty seven, Jeremiah thirty verse seven. They like to know these things. Yes, there's a time of trouble, but we also get saved out of it. Daniel nine, the great. Um, chapter we'll be studying it in a couple of months in our daniel studies on wednesday and uh it begins in verse 24 as god tells gabriel to tell daniel that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people that be daniel his people would be the jews and upon thy holy city that would be jerusalem to finish the transgression, to make end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, going to set up the kingdom, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and anoint the most holy as king of kings in Jerusalem. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. And he lays out a time period. Um, God has appointed times that he is going to work in. Where are the times found? In the Bible, in his words. God was nice enough to let us know when he's going to do stuff. Not just what he's going to do, but when he's going to do it. Why is it people don't know these things? Yeah, they don't read the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. And if you believe words of Hebrew and Greek uh, scholars and modern Bibles, you won't understand any of this. In order to know these things, you have to be walking closely with the Lord, and he's not walking with the books that unbelieving scholars wrote in his name. Those are counterfeits. Those are pseudonyms. He did not into that stuff. He didn't write it. His spirit doesn't attend to it. And the natural man can never figure out the things of God without the Spirit of God showing him, and the Spirit of God's only going to guide him into what he wrote. These times are in the book. Nobody knows. You can know. The only thing you can't know is the day Jesus comes back and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. That's the only day you can't know. You could know the time of the first coming, you can know the time of the rapture, and you can know within easily a decade the time of the second coming. It's laid out in the scriptures. Okay, go to Job 24. Look, it doesn't matter. I mean, what you really need to know is that Jesus is the Christ, and you better help someone get saved before this happens. The time of Jacob trouble is coming. Job 24, verse 1. Good question. Why? Seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, he knows what, when he's going to do things. He's got the appointed times. Why do they that know him not see his days? Why, why can't you see them? You don't study to show yourself approved. You don't rightly divide. I'm talking to the teachers out there, not to you guys. You're sitting in a pew. It's not your job. I'm talking to the teachers out there, the ones on radio, the ones on TV, the ones that hold prophecy conferences, trying to find prophecy in a newspaper, in a magazine, rather than in a Bible. I have no idea what they're talking about. Why? They don't, they don't study. They don't get on bended knee. They don't ask. Go back to... Uh, Daniel 9. And the thing you learn about when you study a Daniel uh, chapter 9 is that he's dividing this work into what are called weeks. And he lays them out. There's a total of uh, 70 weeks, he tells us. And the weeks are defined back in Leviticus and Genesis and Ezekiel. And they're not weeks of days, they're weeks of years. 
And so they're uh, 70 weeks of years. So 70 times seven weeks, seven years in a week. 70 times seven is 490 years. And he's laying out perfectly the time of coming of the Messiah. Uh, verse 26, after three score and two weeks, along with the seven weeks of the prior uh, verse, a Messiah shall be cut off. And they telling you how long it's going to be from the decree of Artaxerxes till the coming of the Messiah is laid out there. And there was one man and one woman that knew, Simeon and Anna. You read about them in Luke chapter 2. And they knew when he was coming. The Pharisees had no clue. The Sadducees had no clue. King of the Jews was born. Who, what, when, where, what's going on here? Why? Why are those teachers not knowing these things and a couple of simple Bible readers hanging around the temple knew the answers? Because they read their Bible and they hung around the temple and they stopped walking with politicians. Yeah. And, and the thing that he wants to show you is verse 27, the prince that shall come, verse 26, middle of verse 26, that's 13 plus 13, that's the Antichrist, the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, verse 27, and he, that wicked prince, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and the overspreading of abominations, he'll make it, the temple desolate, even until the consummation till everything is consumed, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate, and God will pour his wrath upon all the people who are desolate of his truth. And it's all laid out here, and that's the time of Jacob's trouble, the one week when they signed the covenant with the wicked prince. In the middle of it, he abominates the temple and sets himself up as God inside of the temple, and it's being laid out. So back to where we are in Jeremiah 30. Verse 7, alas, that day is great. None is like it with someone standing in the temple and saying they're God. And that day is the time of Jacob's trouble. And what God is going to be doing is uh, purifying his uh, people. Why is he doing this? You've got to go to the next book, Ezekiel chapter 20. And he'll give Ezekiel, who's coming in right on the heels of Jeremiah, a little more info. Why this time of Jacob's trouble? And Ezekiel 20, verse 38. And they had polluted God's Sabbaths. Uh, you got to go back to verse 13, 12 and 13, just to see where you are. Verse 11, I gave them my statutes, God says. I showed them my judgments. Verse 12, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them. Who's that? God and the Jews. The Sabbath is for the Jew. It's not for us. Okay? It's a Jewish thing. It's not the church thing. The church worships on the Lord's Day, uh, the day of the resurrection, Sunday. The Jews are to worship on Saturday. I gave them a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me. What else is new? And so they rebel again once he, what, what he had done. So verse 38, here's what he's going to do in the trib. I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. Uh, I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And so God's going to have this tribulation time of Jacob's trouble to purge the rebels out. He doesn't want them coming in to the millennial kingdom because they don't like God's words. They don't want to follow God's ways. They want to do that which is right in their own eyes, and he's not going to permit that in the millennium. The days of them doing that are over. And so the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be troubling because as we saw, I don't know if any of you were here on Wednesday night, go to Zechariah 13. 
and he makes you study a lot to get these truths. Zechariah 13 and uh, verse 8 tells Zechariah. Zechariah is a prophet that comes quite a bit after uh, Jeremiah, about 120 years later, after they've rebuilt the second temple. And God is giving Zechariah a prophetic visions of the book of Revelation. And Zechariah ties together with Revelation. And uh, verse 8, and it'll come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein and in the time of jacob's trouble while the antichrist is ruling in israel god is telling his jewish people with 144,000, you've got to get back to the word of the lord you've got to stop following this man and this temple you've got to stop following all other religions you've got to get back to my word and uh one third will actually get back two thirds are going to die in their sin believing the lies verse 9 and i the lord will bring the third part through the fire of the tribulation and will refine them as i'm purging out the rebels as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried and they'll come through the other side calling on my name and i will hear them and i will say it is my people and they'll say the lord is my god so back to where we are in jeremiah 30. I wish God would all put this in one chapter so you don't have to go all over the book. But but God told the prophet Isaiah, this is the way I'm going to write. I'm going to make you study. I'm going to make you search. Teachers, okay, not, not you folks, teachers. Uh, Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. Timothy, is this the business you're going in? Timothy, then stop reading newspapers and stop going to conferences and get in your den and read my book and ask me for direction, Timothy, and, and rightly divide the word of truth. This is what you're going to do for an occupation, then occupy till I come. What a shame it is today with the mess that's gone on. It, it breaks my heart to see what's happened. And, and he's showing, you, you, this is the way I've written my book. And you're not going to get it the first time. And you're not going to get it the second time, Timothy. And you're going to have to read and reread and study and meditate and pray and learn to put the verses together and hear a little and there a little and line upon line and precept upon precept. That's what you're going to have to do. I don't like doing it. Then get another job. Get the hell out of the ministry. Get an honest job. Sell drugs. Be a pimp. Do something you know that's legitimate. God's sakes. And God considers that more legitimate than pissing on his word and pretending you know him when you don't. You'll see, people. You're all going to see. I know you don't get it, but I get it, and you're going to see it when God judges these people at the white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. Get another job. There's other things you can do with your life than pretend you know God when you don't. Someone was telling me about some stupid jackass Episcopal priest that guy better get out of what he's doing. Throw the robes off. You know, or else get, get a robe and, and go to one of those uh, Greek festivals with the gays. Do something like that. But don't act like you know God when you don't. That's dangerous stuff. The deeds overpass the deeds of the wicked, God says. That's the worst thing you can do. That day is great, saith the Lord, and none is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he'll be saved out of it. Verse 8, it'll come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will break his yoke from off thy neck. I will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Uh, now, God's plan at the time of the millennium, as the millennium commences, one of the first things he's going to do is he's going to raise and resurrect all the faithful Jews. 
of the Old Testament, one of whom is David. You remember this in Revelation chapter 20. I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them, that would be all of them, and those in the trib that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, and received the mark in their forehead. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. What is the first resurrection? It's the first resurrection taught by Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. And Jesus was uh, teaching at the Feast of the Jews in Jerusalem in this chapter. Because Jesus was bringing God's word to his people. And thankfully there were a few that heard. But there were many that didn't. And afterwards, um, and, and Jesus, when he was teaching, he said in uh, verse 25, uh, Verily, John 5:25. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and, and physically dead people will be resurrected, and they shall come forth, and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. The people that have heard God's word and believed, they died in faith. Jesus is going to raise them up at the blessed and holy first resurrection. Then there's a semicolon, and a thousand years later, they that have done evil will come up to the resurrection of damnation. That's for the white throne judgment, where they'll be cast into a lake of fire. And so there's two resurrections, the first, and then a thousand years later, the second. The first, to enter into the millennium. A thousand years later, all the unbelievers from the ages past are resurrected to be cast into the lake of fire so we can go from the millennial kingdom to the eternal kingdom. Back to where we are in. Uh, Jeremiah, chapter 30. And so God gives the prophecy of the time of Jacob's trouble and the promise that he's going to save them out of it. And the promise continues in verse 10 that Jacob will be at rest. And David will be raised up. David will be the king of in Israel. Now you say, well, Jesus will be the king too. Yeah, he's the king of kings sitting in Jerusalem, but he's allowed to travel the whole world over. David's job is to stay in Israel as the vice regent and to keep control over Israel for the thousand years. And Jesus is allowed to move around the world at leisure, and he is the king of kings. Verse 10, therefore, Fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar. He's going to come back from heaven. Revelation 19, heaven open and the white horse, and here comes Jesus coming back to save his people at the end of the trib. Um, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be in rest and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid, for I am with thee, saith the Lord. And when God's standing next to you, nobody can scare you. And nobody can put fear in you when, when you're standing next to the Creator right there. And He's going to be right there. And, and um, I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whether I've scattered thee, they're going to be done. I'm, they're going to be all gone. By the way, one of the nations the Jews have been scattered to is the United States of America. And he's going to make a full end of it. Every nation that the Gentiles have started, he's going to destroy. He's not looking for Gentile nations in the millennium. He's going to order the nations in the millennium, and they're going to be ordered after the 12 tribes of Israel. 
and I will make a full end of all the nations whither I've scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, because the only nation God ever started was Israel. So, you know, that's another thing that bothers me uh, when I hear modern Christian teachers who are building the kingdom. Are you, he's not building a kingdom. He's building a church right now. He's not building a nation or a kingdom. He's not trying to save America. He has no intention of saving America. He's going to destroy America with all the other nations, too. Yes, he'll destroy Iran and Russia and China, which I know makes your little hearts happy, but he's going to destroy your nation too. And if you're born again, you're a citizen of uh, heaven and you're a member of his bride and this isn't your issue. You have only the issues of your heart are salvation and helping other people get saved and the scriptures. Those are the issues of your heart. And keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And America's dead. I've only heard one other guy figure that out recently. He got it right. And Bob Alexander, he said, America's dead. It's over. It's finished. There's going to be no revival. Amen. Good for you, brother Bob. You're right. Make a full end of it. It's done. Uh, I will not make a full end of thee, verse 11, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Why? For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable. Thy wound is uh, grievous. It's incurable to you. You can get all the doctors you want, whether they be uh, uh, medical doctors or whether they be uh, doctors of the law at the temple who are studying the Bible. They can't fix this bruise. It's incurable to you, and the wound is grievous. Uh, there is none to plead thy cause that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. Uh, this is interesting. The bruise and the wound isn't physical, it's spiritual. It's a spiritual wound. Now, we, we know from Isaiah uh, 53, when we studied that a while back, that, and I, I want to read it, get the words right for you, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes we are healed and he's talking about the healing of the sin in our soul and our spirit now why do i bring this up because back in jeremiah when he says to you this bruise in your spirit and your soul is incurable this wound inside your heart your spiritual heart is grievous and thou hast no healing medicines what he's saying is psychology and psychiatric meds can never, ever, ever fix a spiritual problem. All psychiatric meds are nothing more than sorcery. There's no reason to take any of them. They affect the body. They have no impact on your thoughts. They have no impact on your depression. They have no impact on your anxiety. Said who? God. God just said it. Stop believing liars. There's one medicine never cross your lips. It's psychiatric pills. No, thank you. No, thank you. God just said it's incurable. God just said the medicines don't work. Why waste your money on them? Why spend your money on the medicines or the jerk that's giving them to you? You're either going to believe God or you're, or you're going to believe what you can't. You're going to believe what you want. You're going to do what's right in your own eyes. That's another thing. Where have the men in the pulpits been for the last 50 years? Psychology and psychiatry is garbage. It's crap. It's dung. As a lost man, I knew that when I was in medical school. These guys aren't doctors. They're frauds. These guys are clowns. They don't understand the first thing about a soul or a spirit. They don't even believe in it. Your brain is not responsible for your thoughts or your feelings. Your brain is, is like with a computer. It's the hard drive. It's the software that determines the 
information moving about. And the software is your soul and your spirit and your heart on the inside. You have no healing uh, medicines. Uh, let's see, um, verse 15. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable. Why? For the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. I've done these things to thee. God says, listen, you want to disobey my word. You want to live the way you want to live. You want to walk around like I don't exist and be an agnostic and an atheist. I'm going to put anxiety and depression and stuff on you because you're so full of sin on the inside and no shrink is going to fix it. And if you're dumb enough to pay for him, then waste your money on that garbage. And if your body gets sick, and by the way, those drugs, you don't know anything about them. They affect synapses and neurons all over the body. They're supposed to work in your mind. All of a sudden, your stomach's not working anymore. All of a sudden, your muscles aren't working anymore. All kinds of problems are happening all over your body because they can affect your mind, but they can affect every nerve in your body. God's telling you these things. Wake up, Christian. Okay, lost man, do what you want. You're a knucklehead anyways, but Christians ought to know better. Read your Bible and learn some truths. Anyways, uh, I've done these things to thee, verse 15, God says. I mean, this is divine punishment for sin right here and right now. I don't have to wait for hell to punish you. I can give you some trouble right here. And maybe that trouble will stir you up and get you to look up, and then I can fix you. And you can run to the great physician rather than these frauds. Verse 16, Therefore all they that devour thee shall be devoured. And one day all the psychiatrists and psychologists will stand naked before God as they get cast into a lake of fire. And... Um, and, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, they'll go into captivity. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all they that prey upon thee will I give thee for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee. I will heal thy wounds, saith the Lord. And Jesus will be bruised. And that was the Lord being bruised for our iniquities. Because they called thee an outcast. Saying, oh, this is Zion whom no man seeketh after. Nobody wants to be a Jew in the Old Testament. No one wants to be a born-again Christian in the New Testament. The world uh, reviles and mocks and scorns the very people God has chosen because they refuse the God that chose them. And God says, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of this. You will be at rest, and your enemies will be destroyed. And he closes uh, the uh, chapter with the truth that he will rebuild uh, Jerusalem, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents. I will have mercy on his dwelling places and the city, that's the holy city, shall be builded upon her own heap and the palace uh, shall remain after the manner thereof. Once Jesus sets it up, it'll never be taken down again. The increase of his government, there shall be no end. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry, and I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I also will, be, uh, will glorify them, and they shall not be small, either in size nor in number. Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in those days. He's going to make them big again. They'll be the size of Goliath. And in number, Deuteronomy 28, he's going to increase them by thousands. So if you've got a million Jews, you'll have a billion Jews all of a sudden. Uh, verse 20, their children also shall be as aforetime. That would be the lifespan of Genesis 5. That means you live a thousand years, no longer 70 or 80 years. God's going to reset everything. It's going to be like the Garden of Eden in the Millennial Kingdom. And in the Garden of Eden, they were giants. Men were six cubits tall, not four cubits tall. Uh, men were given a lifespan of a thousand years, uh, and they were meant to be fruitful and multiply, and they will, and they were given a large mind to understand things. And all these things will be happening at that time. Uh, their children will be as aforetime. The congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. And their nobles, their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governors shall proceed from the midst of them. God's going to set up 
a Jewish men who've been faithful men with the scriptures. God's going to choose who the nobles are and who the governors are. He's going to choose them carefully from those who have chosen God as their God and his word as the word. And I will cause him to draw near and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? Ye shall be my people and I will be your God. Now, doctrinally, he's talking to the Jews. Spiritually, it does apply to us. He's our God. We're his people. We're his bride. But doctrinally, historically, it's, it's the Jews. And then verse 23, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath done it until he have performed the intents of his heart in the latter days, he shall consider it. And right now, a lot of Jews are living as liberals, paying no attention to what God's doing. But in these days, when the whirlwind is going forth, you can read Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord have it his way in the whirlwind, and he's able to destroy things in a whirlwind and preserve things in the eye of the storm. And those in the eye of the storm he'll preserve, and they'll be considering it. And that is the time of Jacob's trouble. Amen.